Join with me and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 7 this morning as we continue in worship together. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. This is our 10th part together going through this book of scripture. The book of Ecclesiastes is a book of poetry and proverbs and philosophy all kind of rolled together. It's a book that is written from the ground level. It gives us the raw details of life from the ground level, a perspective of life that is not from the control tower of heaven, but it is from the day-to-day grind of Monday to Saturday, looking at this world, seeing what God is doing in our lives and around us. As you're turning to chapter 7, I want to go back to the day May 25th, 1979. May 25th, 1979. It was a very infamous day in our history as a country. The flight was flight 191, 191. It was heading out of Chicago, out of this airport you see pictured behind me. It went crashing down that day. And it caused 273 fatalities. A very massive, massive tragedy that happened in our country. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, I want to tell you the stories of two different men that were very much intertwined to Flight 191. The first was a Christian man who was in New York City. He was desperately trying to catch his flight to get to Chicago to get on 191. And on that day, he was running trying to make the flight, but an unexpected delay caused him to miss the flight that would have got him there to get on that plane. However, there was another man that I want to point out to you. He was a pastor, the pastor of the Garden Grove Orthodox Presbyterian Church. His name was Edward E. Elliott. He was on a plane from Pennsylvania. His plane was late, and a friend who had accompanied him to Chicago saw him dashing, running down the hall, trying to catch that plane. His friend saw him running. That was the last image of this beloved pastor who got on the flight that went down, and he lost his life that day. So two different Christians. One, their plane is delayed. They can't get to Chicago. The other runs to get on the plane that takes his life. Here's my question. Was God only in control in New York City, but not in control of Chicago that day? Was he only watching over the one man who didn't get on the plane, but did he miss what was happening with the other pastor who got on the plane? All of a sudden, chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes begins to shift, and it begins to help us not to think about how wisdom helps us, but some of the limitations of earthly wisdom. All of a sudden, this book shifts from us trying to understand the grid of life to us saying there are certain things that we are limited to understand. And instead of trying to figure it all out, we need to submit to God's sovereignty. We need to submit to who God is. So what do we mean by this? Trying to figure out the story of these two men, same day, both Christians, totally different endings to the day for them. What does it mean to submit to God's sovereignty? Well, John Piper has said, sometimes we need to plunge our minds into the ocean of God's sovereignty, which sounds like it's a pretty big thing if we're going to plunge our minds into it. We need to feel the weight of God's sovereignty like deep and heavy water pressing in on every pore of each one of us the deeper we go. A billion rivers of God's providence pour into the ocean of God's sovereignty. That's very picturesque and beautiful language. Doesn't really help us to understand what do we mean by the sovereignty of God. So I'm going to give you what I think is the greatest definition of this. It is by A.W. Pink. He says, what does it mean to say that God is sovereign? What does it mean on that day, May 25th, 1979, to say God is sovereign. When that flight goes down, one person goes down with the plane, one person gets delayed. What does that mean? This means the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the Godhood of God. To declare that God is sovereign is to say that God 
is God. It is to say and to declare that God is the Most High. He does according to His will in all the army of heaven and among all the inhabitants of the earth. That no one can stop his hand or say to God, what are you doing? To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the Almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and on earth. That no one can defeat his counsel. No one can thwart God's purposes or resist his wills. To say that God is sovereign is to declare he is the governor, the ruler of all nations. Setting up kingdoms, overthrowing empires, determining the course of dynasties as he pleases best. To say that God is sovereign is to say is he is the only potentate, the only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Then Pink says, such is the God of the Bible. Amen. Today, we are going to go on a journey in the second half of chapter 7, and we are going to learn what it means not to be wise and to figure out how to walk in this world, but instead to see the limitations of our wisdom and how instead to submit to the sovereignty of God and realize that His mind is so much greater. His will is so much more important. His strength is so much stronger that we are only looking at one tree or two trees or three trees in front of us. God has a plan. He's over in charge of the whole forest of this world. That our will is maybe one river into the ocean, one tributary leading in. But his plan is in the whole ocean of his sovereignty. And we need to plunge deeply into that today. So hear with me the word of the Lord, chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. We won't read the whole section yet. Let's just read a few verses to get started. Solomon says, consider the work of God, for who can make straight what he has made crooked? And the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider Surely God has appointed the one as well as the other, so that man can find out nothing that will come after him. I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you grasp this, and also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all. This is the word of the Lord. Solomon puts us to work today. He puts us to work and he calls on us, he bids us to look around, to consider, and to see the work of God. To see God in the good things of this world, but also to be challenged by seeing him in the hard things of this life. Do not be afraid to look at life. God has not acted at random. God is not simply a clockmaker who wound the clock up and lets it roll. Nor is God a passive person in the theater of this world. God is at work right in the center, in the nitty gritty, on the ground level of our lives. Look around and see the purpose of what God has done. In your life today, I want to encourage you that if you have went through pain and problems and struggles, God has not disappeared from the equation. That God is not simply passively watching your life like you go and file into a movie theater and you hope you get a good seat where you can put your feet up on the seat in front of you and just kicking back and watching what's going on. God is actively, sovereignly involved in our lives in the good as well as the bad. He says, consider this, who can make straight what God has made crooked? Now, that language should kind of spark something in your mind if you've been with us these 10 weeks. Because in the first chapter, in chapter 1, verse 15, Solomon said there, what is crooked cannot be made straight. 
And now he's saying, who can make straight what God has made crooked? Now listen, there are many things in this world that look crooked to our eyes. They look crooked because they don't match up with our will. They thwart our happiness. So we say, that's wrong because it doesn't make me happy. That's wrong because it gets in the way of my plans of what I was going to do with my life. This is not a statement that blames everything on God. Because the reality is many times we are the framer of our own troubles. And often we only see from the ground level, so we don't see what God is doing. But Solomon is challenging us today. He's saying, look, do you have pain in your life? Do you have problems in your life? Are you suffering? Do you feel like things are really crooked around you? The work of God cannot be undone. You can't fix what God has done. Our world is broken and no longer And no matter how hard or how long you try to change it, you can't do it. There is not one particle in the cosmos of this world that escapes the hand of God's providential control. Please think with me for a moment. If God is not in control, we are in trouble. Students, listen to this. The world right now, if God is not in control, this planet Earth is hurtling through space around the sun right now at 66,000 miles an hour and no one is in control. That's an insanely dangerous thought, isn't it? There is no particle in the universe where Jesus is not present. I want you to hear that today. To say that God is sovereign is to say that God is God. We cannot alter the course of things that God ordains. And this is not a threat. This is a refuge to a weary soul. God is at work even in the hardest of days. The things we don't understand. There's a plan. There's a plan Hear me, there is a plan at work in your life. In the days of prosperity, verse 14, in the days of adversity, at pleasure and in pain. What did Job say? Job said, naked came I out from my mother's womb, and naked will I return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The idea here is is that God answers to no one but himself. He shares his power with no one. There are days of blessing in our lives. Some of us have more days of prosperity than others. We're supposed to enjoy those days. Enjoy them, the Bible says. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. It's nothing wrong with smiling and having peace in your heart. We should be encouraged to have this. But also... There are days of adversity. Here's what, I, what I've discovered. Prosperity helps us discover our sins. Prosperity teaches us our vices very quickly, doesn't it? Because in our prosperity, when things are going good, we often forget God. And yet, in the same way, adversity helps us to discover our virtues. Pain is a wake-up call to make us figure out what really matters in our lives. What is most important? Pain develops character deep inside of us. Solomon says man can find nothing out that will come after him. In other words, your future path is not something you can figure out on your own. It's hidden in God's will. It's hidden in God's sovereignty. God answers to no one and he shares his power with no one. Now, the reality is you can look into the past and you can make predictions about the future, but they're only predictions. We can have an inkling of what's coming ahead in our lives, but we don't always know what's going to happen. No one saw World War I coming. No one saw the Great Depression coming. No one saw the Great Recession coming. To get a little more into modern history, no one saw a freshman senator from Chicago become the first African-American president, President Barack Obama. No one saw a playboy businessman and celebrity TV show host become President Donald J. Trump. Those are just two big, big examples of what is true in our lives and the small things as well. Listen, we are not God. We are not in control And sometimes we need to be reminded of that. 
Listen, you do not know what will happen to you at the beginning of 2020, which is just a few months away, and you have no idea what the end of 2020 will look like. The reality is you do not know in the morning what's going to happen in the evening, day by day. What is Solomon trying to say? You are not God. You are not holding the steering wheel of this world. You are not in control of all things. I mean, he may, gives us a very evident proof of this in verses 15 and 16. These words refute the whole ideology of karma. All right? Verses 15 and 16 blow away that philosophy. Look what it says there again. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness. There is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? Solomon is saying, I've seen it all. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. I began my life, Solomon could say right here, following God. My father David was a man after God's own heart. I, as a young man, was seeking God so passionately that when God appeared to me and asked me what I would want, I gave the very selfless request that I could be able to discern between right and wrong so I can lead God's people well. And God gave me that and so many other things. I started out my life well. I was married to one woman, which is where the book, The Song of Solomon, came from. I was passionate about my wife. Life was good. But then you read Solomon's story, and in the prosperity, he discovered his sinfulness. And he started to fall very far from God. He delved into apostasy. His life was a spiritual train wreck. He has seen it all. He's seen money and power and riches and women. And he's known vanity. He's known a life of no joy. And what's crazy to him is he's seen both the righteous and the wicked, and their lives have been totally the opposite of what most religions would say they would be like. What do I mean by that? Well, when you read in the Old Testament the, the descriptors, the righteous or the wicked, this speaks of a pattern of life in an individual. It's the same way in the New Testament, actually. In other words, the righteous does not mean that they never don't act rightly. And the wicked, the, the one here who is full of wickedness does not mean that they don't do good things from time to time. It's speaking of a pattern of life. So here's an example from the New Testament. 1 John 2.19, we are warned there, if you know that God is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of God. In other words, a righteous person isn't saved for just a moment. God saves them at a point of time but he's still presently saving them and he will save them in the future. In other words, being saved doesn't mean you made a decision for God or you tried God out or you got some fire insurance one day because you didn't want to go to hell and you did the religious Jesus thing at some point. When you become a Christian, your life becomes patterned after righteousness. You follow Jesus. We sang that song today about following Jesus. It's not simply a one-time act. It's a lifetime act. There's bumps along the way. There's bruises along the way. There's scars along the way. We fall all the time, but we'll never fall finally because the pattern of our life is righteousness. The same is true of the non-Christian. The pattern of their life is wickedness. It doesn't mean they don't do good things. It doesn't mean that they, uh, don't, they can't be nice, kind, moral, decent people. They surely are often. But the pattern of their life is controlled by pride and selfishness and sin. So I think Solomon looks back at the world and he says, can there really be a righteous God? Because there's a just man who perishes in his righteousness. By the way, this goes against everything televangelist Christianity teaches, doesn't it? Televangelist TV Christianity says it this way. Faith promise, word of faith, seed faith, your best life now, write your own ticket your win ticket with God, God's master key to prosperity. If there's pain in your life, there's sin in your life. God is punishing you. If you have wealth and happiness, God is blessing you. 
I want to say to you that is so far removed from the Word of God. There are righteous people who suffer and perish. Think about Job. Naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked will I return. The Lord gave, the Lord took away. He lost it all and he was a righteous man. And yet in all this, here's the thing about the pattern of life. Job did not charge God with wrong and sin against God. He recognized that simply because it's raining in your world, simply because there's lightning bolts coming down all around you, doesn't mean some sort of karma is happening. The righteous can very much suffer. You say, give me another example. Job's not a good enough example. I'll give you the first example in the Bible. Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. Abel's righteous. He gets a massive headache. On the first day, we find out about him, right? As he's killed by his brother. He's righteous. He follows God and he loses his life for being righteous. Just because you're right with God does not guarantee that you're not going to suffer in this world. You can't guarantee anything by your behavior. Too much of Christianity is what some people call moralistic therapeutic deism, which is just a bunch of words, terms strung together to mean just be good enough, try harder, and God will be happy with you and you'll have your best life now. It's not how the Bible teaches it at all. You can't guarantee anything simply by behavior. There's good people that suffer, and there's bad people who prosper in this world. Don't believe me? Just look at the political scene in America. Just look at our country. Now, verse 16 has been very confusing to a lot of people, as is verse 17. Because Solomon says here, do not be overly righteous, which a lot of you who are living some, court of a, some kind of a lukewarm, backslidden Christianity, you're just trying to make ends meet spiritually, meaning you're just doing the bare essentials to get through your Christian life. You're like, yes, I don't have to be overly righteous. Forget that whole following hard after God thing. I'll go to church once a month. I'll pray if I ever get in a dark alley somewhere, and God's good with me. It's not what Solomon is saying. You cannot love God too much, honor God too highly, strive after him too passionately. The danger lies not in our excess of following after God, it's in our defect and not going far enough. So what is this saying? This is a warning against the obsession of always being proved right. This is a warning against being a hyper-Christian, of being a super-Christian. If you don't know what one is, I can introduce you to some after the service today. What is a hyper-Christian, a super-Christian? This is the person who is never wrong. This is the person who is always right, who knows it all, who's better than everyone else. This is the person who walks around and their head never bows down. And their knees never hit the floor. Unless someone else is watching, of course. Because then they might put a good show on for everybody. This is the person who always prays loudly, but never prays quietly. This is the person who always looks the part of the perfect Christian, which does not exist. Let me tell you why this is really dangerous. If you are always right at home, you're going to have a terrible marriage. And all the husbands and wives said together unanimously, amen. Being married to a perfect spouse, let's just be honest, being married to a perfect spouse really sucks. It's terrible. It's a horrible way to live. By the way, children in the room, don't answer out loud. When was the last time your parents said to you they're sorry and admitted that they did wrong? Don't say it out loud. Don't say it out loud. Don't embarrass them. If your parents, parents, just listen to me. I'm telling your kids something because I want them to learn. If your parents haven't told you I'm sorry lately and haven't admitted their failure, kids, you can ignore this next part. Parents, you're acting like you're God because there's only one righteous one and that's God Almighty. 
And you are going to fail your children and you're going to fail your spouse. And we need to live a life that is very honest about those failures. You're also going to fail your coworkers. And you're also going to fail your friends. And you're going to fail your family. And the point is, when he says, don't be overly righteous, he's saying, stop trying to be God. Stop beating yourself up all the time. Stop being so hard on yourself. Pretending your perfectness in this life will produce everlasting life in the life to come. This is the kind of person that thinks on the day of judgment, they're going to challenge God for failing to reward him the way they deserve to be rewarded. I deserve better shaking your fist at God. It's about my happiness and my life and what I want now. This is self-destructive. If you have to win every argument, you will alienate everyone around you. People will know you're self-righteous. And as long as you're looking down on everyone else, you'll never be able to look up and see the Lord's mercy and grace. This is a warning here. Listen, the point of this is God cannot be manipulated by your behavior. He will not be coddled by you. God will not be possessed by you. God is to be feared. He is not safe. God is not manageable. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. They are higher. He is sovereign. Stop trying to bring him down to your level because he's not ever going to come to your level. I think of the great book by C.S. Lewis, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Mr. Beaver is talking to Susan. And he is telling Susan that the ruler of Narnia is a lion named Aslan. And Susan is surprised because she assumed that the ruler of Narnia must have been a man. And then she tells Mr. Beaver, I feel really nervous about meeting the ruler of Narnia, a lion. She's very nervous about it. And then she asks this infamous question. She says to him, is is Aslan safe? And this is the famous quote. Maybe you've heard it before. He says back to her, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he is good because he's the king. That is true about God as well, my friends. He's not safe. He's not to be manipulated or coddled or to be possessed. He is not safe at all, but he is good because he is the king of this world. His children fear him. Our God is a lion to be feared, not a kitten to be petted. There is no standing before a lion, and there is no contending with Almighty God. His children fear him, but this fear does not make us run from him. It makes us run to him and keep close to him because he keeps us safe in these very hard days. He also adds, by the way here, do not be overly wicked, which reminds us God does not tolerate sin. His eyes are too pure to behold sin. Don't become complacent with your sin. Don't play with your sin. Owen said, kill sin or sin will kill you. This is the path of foolishness, to simply be content in your sin. Sin will hurry your body and your soul to destruction. Think about Haman. Haman in the book of Esther played with his hatred of Mordecai and his hatred, his racism, his ethnocentricity, thinking that uh, his people group were greater than the Jews. He played with that sin. He built gallows to hang Mordecai, playing with this hatred in his heart, and it ultimately led to him dying very quickly, didn't it? It's dangerous to play with sin. Think about how in the Bible, King Herod played with pride as king in Acts chapter 12. And he literally was eaten by worms, which I think was God's sense of humor to show us how low God will take us if we will not humble ourselves. What's the point of all this? Just because someone's life is hard doesn't mean they're bad. And just because someone's life is easy doesn't mean they're good. Because someone lives a long life doesn't mean God was so excited to keep you around. And just because you have a short life doesn't mean someone's a terrible person. If life is going good, don't pat yourself on the back today and say, I'm so good at earning all these things I have. 
And if life is going terrible, stop thinking that God is punishing you because of it. There is no karma in this world, Solomon is trying to say. There will be justice in the world to come, but there's no karma in this world. God is sovereign. He's at work in the forest. We only see the trees. Let's continue on with our last few minutes. Verse 18. It is good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other. For he who fears God will escape them all. Wisdom strengthens the wise more than 10 rulers of the city. For there is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Also, do not take to heart everything people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. For many times also your own heart has known that even you have cursed others. Solomon is making something very clear here. Every one of us is weak. We are all sinners. We are all prone to wander. We are all pl- prone to blow it. Calvin said, all of our hearts are literally factories that are constantly creating new idols that make us drift away from God. What does he mean by this here? There is not a just man who does good and never sins. He's saying this, if you're dating someone in this room today and you think that they're so great and they're so perfect, I promise you, when you marry them, you're going to learn otherwise. Children, if you think your parents are so great that they're never going to fail you, I hate to tell you they are. If you got a new job and you think everything is hunky-dory and things are wonderful and you've got the perfect boss, the boss is going to let you down one day. Your coworkers are going to let you down one day. If you think the grass is surely greener on the other side, the only reason why is because there's more manure over there making the grass greener. Hear Solomon's heart. We are broken people in a broken world. Proverbs 20 verse 9 says it this way. Who can say I have made my heart clean and I am pure from my sin? One writer has said, my repentance needs to be repented of. My tears need washing. The very washing of my tears need to be washed again with the blood of Jesus, my Redeemer. If you think so highly that you've got it all figured out, that you're without sin, that you're righteous, life is good because of how great you are, you believe your own press and your own publicity, if you say you have no sin, John says, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. So let's apply that in verse 21. Do not take to heart everything everyone says about you. Don't be disturbed when you hear people talk bad about you. They're going to. People have come to me many times as a pastor over the years, and this is what they say. Pastor, these are usually people that are really not my friends. They're trying to pretend to be. They'll say, Pastor, I want you to know people are talking. People are talking. If you you have that in your vocabulary, I I implore you to get that out of your vocabulary. Because the first thing I say is, what people? You're not going to like my answer. What people? Are you gossiping? Which ones are talking? I'd like to know. Can you give me their names? Because I like to call them and invite them in on the conversation. Let's call them right now. We could do three-way call, four-way call. I don't know. What people are talking? If you volunteer to do anything, in fact, if your life is doing anything that matters, someone's going to complain. Parents, don't be weary in well-doing when you correct your children. It doesn't say train them up in the way they want to go. Train them up in the way they should go. They're going to complain when you tell them to do the right thing. If you are serving God, you better believe somebody's going to criticize you. There's always gossips, slanderers, and critics. Solomon here almost sounds like the great theologian Judge Judy. No good deed goes unpunished, doesn't he? If you're doing the right thing, don't be shocked if people complain and get angry at you. Charles Spurgeon said it another way. He said, if any man thinks ill of you, do not be angry with him because you are far worse than he thinks you to be. Let's get honest this morning. Spurgeon also gave some advice. He said, what we should do is instead give them the blind eye and the deaf ear when they complain. 
If you're in God's will, it doesn't matter what anyone else says. He took that idea from David in Psalm 38, where David said, I'm like a deaf man, I do not hear. I'm like a mute man who does not open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, and his mouth are no rebukes. Give them the blind eye and the deaf ear. That's called showing grace to your critics. We would not want to be judged by our worst moments. We should not judge others by their worst moments. Why? Verse 22, because we've done the same thing behind people's backs. We've all blown it. We've all talked bad about others behind their backs. It's easy to judge someone else. It's much more difficult to take responsibility for my own actions. By the way, I would also add that when people criticize, when people come to me and say, Pastor, people are saying, I want to hear what they have to say. Because I recognize some of it might be uh, a bologna sandwich, but there might be some truth in what they say. Sometimes there's 10% truth in there. And our tendency is to hold others to a much stricter account than we hold ourselves. Instead, we should be tender with others and watch more closely over our own souls. So be careful. Now, this section ends. We've got to go through it very quickly. Verses 23 to 29. Look with me in your Bibles. This could almost be a whole other sermon, but... I just want to, to read through this and think through two big thoughts. All this I have proved by my wisdom. I said I'll be wise, and it was far from me. As for that which is far off and exceedingly deep, who can find it? I applied my heart to know, to search out and seek out wisdom and the reason of things, to know the, wick, the, the wickedness of folly and even of foolishness and madness. Here you go. I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be trapped by her. Here is what I have found, says the preacher, adding one thing to the other to find out the reason, which my soul still seeks, but I cannot find. One man among a thousand I have found, but a woman among all these I have not found. Truly this only I have found, that God made man upright. But man, but they have sought out many schemes. These verses have claimed to be little more than sexism or misogyny by some liberal interpreters. It's very important to say Solomon is not being a sexist. He's not being some sort of an ungodly misogynist here. He's talking experientially. Solomon tried it all in life. We are told in 1 Kings chapter 11, when Solomon was old, his wives, what's wrong with this sentence? The S, right? His wives, plural, turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Solomon here describes a woman who is dangerous. And so Solomon tried it all. We've already seen Solomon tried wine. Solomon tried riches. He tried power. Now Ecclesiastes 7 turns to another thing that Solomon tried to find happiness on the ground level, women. He started out a man after God's own heart. Read the book of the Song of Solomon. That'll spice up things in your life. Maybe don't read it with your kids if they're young. I mean, that book is a book of marriage. It's a, a very strong and graphic book, to say the least. He was very passionately and devoutly married to one woman. But sin got in the way. And, and this language is very similar to the language in the book of Proverbs when he talks about the adulterous woman, like in Proverbs 5. He says, The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she is bitter like wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. And her, her steps follow the path, the King James says, to hell or to the grave, to Sheol. There, are, there is danger in ungodly relationships. Her hands are fetters. They're like handcuffs. Her heart is like a, a trap, a snare. It's like a steel trap. It is dangerous to find your sufficiency in other people. It is dangerous. You say, I'm not happy in my marriage. Well, listen to me, friend. If you're married to that person, that's the only person 
you're supposed to be pursuing. Happy or not, the problem might not be with the other person in your marriage. The problem might be with you. Rather than leading the teacher to lady wisdom, he has fallen into the arms of lady foolishness. Now, this passage is not simply advice to young men about dating, though it's very good advice about dating, okay? You don't want to uh, follow a woman like this. Young ladies, you don't want to follow a man like this that overpromises and will not perform, will not be a spiritual leader. This is metaphors of seductive hunting, luring and trapping people and leading them to death. And what's interesting here is in verse 27, he says, here's what I have found. I've been trapped by her myself. I've went into the wrong relationships trying to find my purpose in life. I've been trapped in them. And this is what he says here. Here's what I have found out, that I can't comprehend her. Even the wisest man can't understand. Why did I go to all these women? Why did I fail sexually? Why did I fail as king? Why did I fail in my life? Why am I on my face? And it, by the way, it's an amazing thing. It's kind of funny that the man who had so many wives says, I can't figure out women. I mean, it's kind of funny, just saying. But ultimately, the point of this is he's just a man. I'm just a man. By the way, if you're still worried that this is misogynistic, Proverbs 31, Solomon there says, an excellent wife, she is far more precious than jewels. Solomon lifts up women in the Bible as well. This is not an attack on women alone. He's throwing himself under the bus as well. He's made the foolish decision to live this way. So what's the moral of the story? We have to end. God, verse 29, made man upright. We were made in God's image. We were made in God's likeness. The world was made good. The problem is not with God. But man has sought out many schemes. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, tried to do it their way. We tried to do it our way. Instead of submitting to God's sovereignty, all we like sheep have turned astray. We have went to our own way. And because of that, the Lord had to lay on Jesus the iniquity of us all. When you read this here, we celebrate that Jesus is the one exception to this mess of the world. The world is broken. You are not God. Stop looking for happiness in men or women, in wealth, in power, in wine, in pleasure. We are most happy when we find our satisfaction in the one man who lived an upright life, Jesus Christ. Jesus was in every respect tempted as we are, yet he never sinned. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, even though he knew no sin, that the righteousness of God would come into our lives. Jesus was led to the cross. They scourged him. They nailed his hands and his feet. They put his lacerated, broken body on that wood. They hoisted it up on the cross. They jarringly dropped it down into the ground. He suffered death for us, the innocent for the guilty, the just for the unjust. We went our own way. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. We need to stop trying to be God and instead look to God for the help we need. Because in him is everything we need. May we bow our heads and our hearts. May we confess our sins before the Lord. And may we seek his help and his grace.